Thank you, Nicole. Nice to see everybody today. As uh, Nicole said, I'm a digital marketing strategist here at Liquid. Uh, just to give you a quick brief background on myself, I actually owned my own business. It was a local real estate brokerage on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. And I built that business basically through SEO. I uh, then worked, went on to work for a global insurance broker and now here. So I kind of have the understanding on both sides of, you know, as using an agency and also being within it and the importance of SEO from small business to global business. So, it, you know, it's a very exciting time in digital search right now because we're going to see in 2016 digital ad spend for the first time ever is going to outpace TV. And it's actually a monumental shift in what's happening. I mean, the, you know, for the last 50 years, TV has dominated media. And we're seeing that you know, every, globally, everyone is switching their budgets to digital marketing, and for good reason. One is you know, the ability to track. It's so much more thorough using a digital program. And search engine optimization you know, should be part of that program. So and as Nicole mentioned, Google is 100% aligned with matching you with the search you're doing, dependent on device, to what, the intent you're looking for. They've updated their algorithm more times in the last three years than they did the 13 years prior of their existence. And they have one simple thing they're trying to do, connect you to the information you're looking for as fast as possible, making it seamless. And that's absolutely changing because of the way we use devices. It's no longer everyone's doing a desktop search. And when you think about it, when you search on your desktop, you're doing it differently than mobile. And that's leading us, really driving this change in search in 2016. So we're going to look at five search influencers. And right now is their kind of importance from less to more. And we're going to look at a few set up, ways to set up for success, a couple actionable items everyone can take back with them. So the first real search signal now that is absolutely changing is social media. And we, social media really is more than selfies. And uh, I understand, having worked for an insurance broker, we were B2B and B2C. And the B2B world is very hard to see sometimes the advantages of using social media channels doesn't always seem to align with what you're trying to do. But there is a very big monumental shift Google made in 2015. And that was they made a deal with Twitter to be able to ind index all tweets. When you think about that, there's billions of tweets a year. For Google to take that amount of effort and data processing power to begin indexing them shows that there's a signal they're looking for within them. And currently, they don't have a great ability to judge that signal. But think about social media. How do we use it? It's conversational. It's relationships. So they're trying to determine how do we string our words together to show this intent. By not being on you know, prominent social media platforms, you're kind of missing out on a way to give Google signals about yourself. Here's a quick look at a search result for Martin Guitar, which is one of our clients. If you, and you notice, one of the areas highlighted is their Twitter. Google put Martin's Twitter in the top of their search results. So if Martin wasn't found on Twitter, they'd be giving up this position. You can see they're well optimized, they're on the map. But we go look, reviews, very important. I mean, everyone's probably bought something off of Amazon. What's one of the biggest things you start doing a search? You see Amazon has the stars, there's a lot of ratings you can go on and review. Absolutely great social signal because reviews are true. P you know, Google can trust them. It's a third party reviewing your property. It goes on, Google knows that Martin has multiple social media profiles. One thing I will point out is Martin has additional social media profiles that actually aren't there, that you know, structurally they can continue to improve. And the more you can show your people searching for you, the better. I think actually one of the real highlights of the local search result like this for Martin is the customer service number. Now, if you did the same search on mobile, it's gonna come up, but that service number is clickable. So by structuring your website in a way that the numbers are accessible, easy for Google to find, you're creating that seamless user experience. I don't have to, if I need customer service for Martin, go in, dig through their website. That's a bad user experience. I want to find what I want as fast as possible. And as Nicole mentioned, Google's in the search business. They're more seamlessly they can connect users to what they're looking for. That's why their revenue continues to grow. And that the, this knowledge-based searches so all this information comes out of Google's knowledge base. And Google's knowledge base is essentially a giant database of all the information they can categorize and process. Again, here's uh, another client of ours, National Pen. We did a lot with their Google Plus pages to optimize them. As you can see, the local branch is mentioned, the hours. Again, the phone number's right prominently displayed. If it was mobile, it'd be moved on. And by continuing to give Google the signals you want 
that's the, really the search engine optimization going forward. And I'm hopefully going to leave you with a new acronym for SEO going forward because I think the time of search engine optimization is truly somewhat past. We're, we're past that because I feel the optimization angle has this like charlatan feel to it where we all were trying to game Google. And as Nicole mentioned multiple times, the time has passed. Google has 100,000 engineers with one goal, to connect you with knowledge. You know, the time of being able to try and game the system or do this, it's gone. It's really <coughs> about this aspect of how do you get your knowledge and what makes your unique business to the people that are searching for it. And as I mentioned, search is ex changing extremely fast, and it's due to mobile. If you think about it, the way you search on your mobile device or you look for a map, no one's using MapQuest anymore. It's a Google map. It's integrated into that experience of your phone. Google, as far back as 2012, has been looking at how do they take this change of how searches are done from what they call strings, not things, strings being keywords. If you, again, back to that desktop. If you look for something on a desktop, you take a couple keywords, you put it into the browser. What you're typing on search you know, in mobile is completely different. You can use one of the digital assistants or you can speak to it. And then all of a sudden, the, the search engines are now relating how does the context of what we're speaking about deal with the context of the search and the device. People searching things on your iPad at 10 o'clock at night is way different than during your, before your commute on your smartphone. The way you search and the context, the relationship of all these things is what Google's looking for. How do they create the best user experience. And then inversely, from your aspect, how do you put the information that people or the pain points are going to look for, how do you have it there prior to them looking in that conversational aspect? And I think that's very difficult if you look at you know, a lot of uh, web copy is very, you know, search engine speak, so to say. It's, it's keyword laden. It doesn't always well relate to the user. I think that's the paradigm shift you have to look at is what is the end user? Well, how does it benefit them? You know, how does what I do on this page benefit what they're looking for? And Google uses manual testers. As I mentioned, their algorithms are constantly evolving. They don't understand language. That is their next goal. So they take manual testers and they rate websites. And they look at it from a mobile first perspective. And three things every website they look at, they want to know expertise, authoritativeness, trustworthiness, which completely makes sense because if you're looking for a product, you're looking for information, you want to go to a trustworthy source. You don't want to go to a source where you have to search three and four times. Again, it goes back to that user experience level of seamless knowledge for what the person's looking for. And they take it within the context, again, of the device because of all our <coughs> searches are so different. And that is kind of where we begin to see the semantics of Google trying to understand when we speak to something, how does that differ of this search? Is it necessarily the one I'm looking for or not? And that leads us into really what is, I think, the biggest change we're going to see in search 2016 going forward is semantics. Semantics, natural language. How do we use the language? And I think you know a great example is if you look at the verb crash, well, you could crash a car. The stock market could crash. The wave, you know, waves crash on the shore. Symbols crash. There's a multiple uses of that single verb. Now, how does the context of how you're using it relate to your search? And that's where Google is really trying to go. And I mean, right now, they're not there. But there is a number of things you can do to your website to provide it semantical information. And the semantical information is marked up in a, a uh, format called schema.org. And what schema does is you tell Google, this is explicitly what this web page is about. This is explicitly what this is about. And I can give you a pretty good quick example. Our client, Mac Shop. When you think about Mac Shop could relate to how many different things. Could be, is it a mechanic? Is it parts for trucks? In this as instance, it's actually all about Mac merchandise. So we don't want Google to look at it, you know, the ambiguity of this site and say, well, should I be showing it for parts? Or should I be showing it for this? So what we did, worked with Mac was to create a process of implementing the schema structured data into their website to let Google know, no, this is about merchandise. It's explicitly about merchandise for Mac trucks. And what we were able to do by implementing the structured data is you can mark up multiple aspects throughout the site. 
And what we looked at for someone like Mac Shop, who is you know, in e-commerce, again, it goes to customer ratings. It's a great signal. You know, it's at least going to drive people to see because it's independent third party. The next one is called a breadcrumb. The breadcrumbs are important from two aspects. One, it lets people know how to go through and find what they're looking for in their, in your, within your site. But it also gives a lot of semantical indexing to Google. It says that black and gray soft shell, soft shell jacket is also apparel, <coughs> it's men's apparel, and it's outerwear. So now Google has a relationship to all those words and this product. And that's what you're trying to do is just make it a little bit clearer because as the world, you know, the more and more information that's put out there, the more Google has to take effort to crawl through it. What you want to do is say, Google, come to my site. Here's the least amount of information you need to crawl to get the maximum benefit out. And here's where I relate to. Here's where in my industry, I am an expert. And it goes on. I mean, the price and number of reviews, all these have a chance to be shown in any format. You know, they could be shown with just the breadcrumbs or without every time a search is done. And this kind of goes to the, in a very important aspect of your online and offline marketing really needs to be cohesive. Uh, you can cl collect reviews offline and up add them to your site, and then you can mark them up with the rating system. You know, it, it really needs to be that cohesive thing of, yes, how can we further the knowledge on our website, but make it a seamless part of our business interaction. So I thought as part of testing Google's knowledge graph, I would ask it a search on desktop and mobile that it should be able to understand. So I decided to ask it, how many Super Bowls have the Philadelphia Eagles won? I figured it would be able to get it. Aww. But <laughs> that makes me sad. I, I'm a Redskins fan, so I shouldn't have used that one. But hey. <laughs> so as we see, fortunately, Google got it right. That is the desktop search. As you can see, I spelled it all out, no capitalization. The one, next one is Google Now. If you're not familiar, it's Google's version of Siri or Cortana. And it's an app that integrates with across all your devices. And it's a you know, digital assistant. As you can see, it actually knew enough to capitalize the S in Super Bowl, though it made it one word. And it got the answer correct. And if you just notice slightly, they have that mobile experience. Again, it's, they know people are searching on mobile. How do they make it optimized for them? And lastly, I did it on my iPhone and about 10 different variations and it could not figure out the answer. It kept re referring me to the Patriots Eagles Super Bowl game. So it gives you an example, as Nicole said, why Google is continuing to dominate the search landscape is their product is just better. It returns a better relation to what people are searching consistently. And just to give you an idea of how big the Google knowledge graph has grown from, it was initially about 12 million entries. And last calculation was over 5 billion. So you kind of have to look at the knowledge graph is not going anywhere. How do I position my website and my marketing efforts to take advantage of it? And what you have to do, again, it goes back to a semantic of what are people searching for? What are their pain points in relation to your business? Now, this was a quick search I did just to pick the random one uh, to find me uh, some additional, as you see, Google provides additional related questions. And that's actually where your SEO program and marketing can really function very well. If you see, Google said, well, people that search this first question tend to have these other similar type questions. And then we look, well, each of those similar questions were answered via a different website. So each of those sites were authoritative enough in that, in that vertical for Google to say their answer is of the best relation for this person's search. So by providing that content in that semantical, the conversational aspect, adding it to your website, it gives you the chance to be shown in the knowledge graph. And initially, there's a lot of concern around the knowledge graph. No one wanted their information to just be shown. But actually, the inverse happens. People see that snippet of information, and they're intrigued. They want to know more about that. That's why they're doing the search. Now they're driving through to your website. Actually being found in the knowledge graph increase, increases click-through rate. And you know, this is Google, again, is about that user experience. How do they make it as seamless as possible? And people find these answers to be the best. And they're going to continually to refine it. And it actually leads us to really what was one of the biggest news uh, articles within the Google world last year was their announcement of RankBrain. RankBrain is Google's branded artificial intelligence program. And when RankBrain came out, there was a number of 
relations to the Terminator movies and how the machines were going to take over the world and all this kind of stuff. It's actually not there yet, fortunately for all of us. But what it is, is Rank Brain is a neural network. And what they do is they model these networks off the same way our brains work. Our brains all work on electrical impulses and neurons. They build these networks, though they're computer based, the same way. And it's much like you or I or anyone or a child learning a new task. You know, you constantly do it and your brain fires and fires until it gets to the optimum way to tie your shoes or whatever the task is. Well, the same thing works, but in a digital way. Google's rank brain keeps going through, finding an answer, refining it, refining it until it says, okay, for this query I wasn't sure of, we relate these two unrelatable things and it finds the answer and then it says, okay, on to the next one. This only happens in about 15% of all their queries. But it's taking that multiple ambiguities, putting them together and saying, here, this is what it's the relation is. Uh, the best example I saw, someone said, it's much akin to a clerk in a store and you go in and you say, where's that thing that does this? And you kind of make that motion, you're, you're, very, you're not giving it clear directions and then all of a sudden the person goes, oh, the juicer, they're aisle three. You know, so it took two non-related things, enough information on the context of what you were looking for to provide the answer. And that's much what Google's doing. Again, it goes back to how can they get that real answer to you as fast as possible. The interesting thing about the uh, rank brain and looking forward to success is as we are getting ready for this uh, lunch and learn, Google made a major announcement. Their head of search for the last eight years had stepped down and was replaced by their head of artificial intelligence. So if you don't think Google is very serious that AI is the way to make search better, you know, they pretty much sent a signal that said, this is for real and it's not going anywhere. And I think that uh, really to set yourself up for success, it's again not about looking at SEO in that, how do I game the system? It's about providing value to people in the end. And it really is, Nicole mentioned, it's all about content. When we think about content, it's not just words on a page. Content can be video, it can be a social media update. There's millions of different ways to splice and dice content, but it's about your content has to be high quality. And really, the reason it has to be high quality is everyone's creating content. We've all heard for SEO purposes, we need to constantly be an updated and this and everybody's on it. And unfortunately, most of the updates and stuff and content that uh, is created is kind of this. It's how do you stand out from uh, the pile of content? And I think the uh, best way to really make yourself stand out is to focus on creating high quality. It has to be different. It has to be better than everyone else. And it's, again, start with that persona of where are people? Why do they need my service? What are their questions around it? And a lot of times that might be an offline, you know, conversation to have to really get to understand what they're looking for and then translate that information to your digital marketing because that's where they're starting searches I mean people that already are familiar with your business are familiar with it they're the ones that are doing branded searches they're not the ones you're trying to capture through SEO it's about you know expanding that reach to what are people interested in what is the pain point for them what if you're in a b2b world what is the buyer of this product what are their pain points what do they look at why should they choose you? What's your unique selling proposition? All this information has to be translated online because there's, as we know, thousands of e-commerce people. There's thousands of people in every business. It's about telling your unique story to everyone. It's about, you know, that's what makes you different. And the one way to really be able to do it is through repurposing content. If anybody was here for our last uh, fourth quarter lunch and learn that Steve Luvender gave, it was about repurposing content. So I was trying to go with that theme and show you, you know, we repurposed this slide. But the same, thing, uh, the same thing holds true. Steve put forth a lot of excellent value in his Lunch and Learn. Now, we are able to use that considerable times over. You know, as you, everyone understands in the business world, there's a cost to us putting together the Lunch and Learn today. And, you know, there's man at people hours, or there's effort, or time, or whatever aspects to it. But it's how do we, obviously, recoup our value to putting it forth. I mean, having everyone here is wonderful, but we have to use it across multiple mediums to really maximize that value. So I'd just like to give you a quick look at statistics. In the last minute I was speaking, this has all happened. 300 hours of video were uploaded to YouTube. One minute. 293,000 Facebook statuses, 136,000 photos, around what, 1,400 blogs, 204 million emails. If you take that in context, how does your message stand out among that 
And really, it's about crafting it a little bit differently. It has to be that high quality. It has to answer me as a, someone searching for your product, what can you do for me? Because really, in the end, it's about the consumer. It's not too often we you know, write to, we say, oh, we're writing B to B or writing B to C. But it's not. If you think about it in the end, it's human to human. The person making that buying decision is a person. You know, there's no machines. None of us have the rank brain. So all of us are business to people to people. And I think that keeping that aspect really forefront for 2016 is the key. How do you take a human approach to your marketing efforts? And I think one of the big things is don't be boring. This is actually one of our highly, heavily regulated clients. And they uh, decided they were going to look outside the box with their insurance marketing. And I feel I'm coming out of the insurance industry, I'm OK to say it's boring. But as you can see, you know, I don't actually think they are all uh, cover, covered perils, if you want to know. Pterodactyls, and might fall under act of God, I'm not sure. The giant <laughs> octopus and the UFO taking the cow. Again, they may, you know, they, what do they say? Uh, they caught eyes. They were a little bit different. You know, everybody laughed, and that's what it was about. It doesn't change who they were. It just said to them, hey, we have a good time with insurance. You know, we're approachable. It's kind of just taking that little bit. They're very high quality. The images are great. You know, that, uh, it's just taking that aspect a little bit, thinking outside the box. I mean, I, I think a great example, actually, if you want to stay in the insurance world, is Geico. Geico builds to unique buyer personas, and they market to them. You know, again, their stuff is high quality. They provide a lot of knowledge. You know, this is just a different aspect on the same thing. And the same thing about how do you position your brand? Your brand, your business is unique. Everyone is unique. And it's about telling that unique story or brand is SEO really going forward. It's, you know, how, how do you do it? And again, I think this is a great definition if you want one to take away of quality content. It's customer centric, speaks in a human voice, provides the information people need and seek. I think that is, you know, as succinct as it can be. Because really, all your marketing efforts are focused on that. It's all about meeting someone's needs. And those needs just happen to have translated to online today. You know, years ago, it was phone and everything. But I mean, they're translating, as I mentioned, with the digital ad spend moving from TV. You know, we're seeing the eyeballs. Everyone's moving to this digital first world. We always hear about the millennials, you know, being a digital first generation. Well, we're now coming upon mobile first. And it's just, you know, it's constantly going forward. But it, the thing that's never going to go away, that has been held true in business for the last th thousands of years, is you're speaking to people. And I think that's really the takeaway. Now we'll get to my favorite slide of all. How much does quality content cost? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's, it can be very labor or effort intensive. The plus side is, a lot of it you've already have in your organization. You are the thought leader in what you do. It's translating this information to a digital space. And it's, you know, there's a lot of differences in digital marketing and traditional marketing. And digital marketing has the one benefit that the majority of it is all trackable. You know, if you look at uh, print spend, the minute you pay for print advertising, it's done. Once it's been consumed and that paper is no longer a magazine or trade article, you know, is no longer forefront of people's mind, it's done. The thing with digital marketing is, and content especially, is there's a re long-term residual value. So as we were talking about cost, it's not cheap. It's actually quality content marketing up front is very front-end front loaded. And the reason that is is because you're going above and beyond what everyone else is creating. Everyone's creating 300-word posts. Well, now you're doing, you know, 2,000 or 1,500. But it's, again, speaking in that voice to the customer. Sure, it's expensive up front, but as you can see, this uh, stat actually came from Eloqua, and they show that you know, over the long term, the cr there's an inverse correlation between the length of time and the cost. And I think if by creating high quality, what they call evergreen content, content is never going out of style. People are going to ask the same questions generally. They may change how they ask them, but generally the same questions are going to be asked. By creating your content to that aspect and then having the years to recoup that cost, you know, it really becomes a, one of the most cost effective ways to continue advertising. And I think that uh, it's really, it's hard to get over that initial hump, but you have to look at the longevity of it. The content's going to live forever. And as I mentioned about repurposing our last Lunch and Learn, we took one thing, which was a great New Jersey tomato, and we turned it into a whole lot of things. It became video. 
became LinkedIn updates, Facebook, Twitter, <coughs> excuse me, and the video uh, could be even used more. We could have chopped it up into short social media type videos or uh, millions of different ways to use it. And it's again, taking each platform into this unique ability and speaking to that platform. One thing, as Nicola mentioned, is th the change of social media. You cannot, for it to, if you want an SEO value out of it, take one update and populate it across every social media platform. The time is dead because really it's kind of just adding to the noise. If you want to take an actual approach to it, you need to think what makes each person, each group of people you have on that platform unique. You know, the people that are your Facebook fans, most likely all don't translate to your LinkedIn followers or don't translate to Twitter. But again, each of those demographics is unique and each of those personas is unique. And what you need to do is speak to the person that's on that platform. And by speaking to that platform, again, you know, the status update you're going to put on LinkedIn is very different than what you could share on Facebook or Twitter. You know, due to even if you just look at character limits or Twitter's use of hashtags and just the way people are used to add up to, to the device and the platform really is going to change how you do it. So if you start with you know, the really great tomato, you can use it across thousands of recipes. And that's kind of where quality content marketing goes. It's taking something that's going to be reusable long term in one format and splicing it down and using it in multiple recipes. One thing though, if you're going to take the effort, and I hope everyone does, to create a really quality content marketing program, you know, and it, it should be a long term, it's three months, you're going to see no results. So I'll just tell you right now, a three month program is really difficult. You're just kind of getting the momentum. You really need to look at it in a year, a five year, a 10 year. You know, what is your business's long term plan, long term goals? Look to align them. And part of it is the 2080 rule. <clears throat> 2080 rule is simply this for whatever amount of effort you're going to put into creating your content, take four times the effort and promote it. And the reason that is, is if you're going to take the time to make something that's quality, and there's a thousand people that are interested in it normally through your organic reach of using your social media. Well, I would lead me to believe there's probably a hundred thousand people in the country or maybe a million worldwide or depending on your service area. There's people in this across multiple areas that are wondering, you know, the same questions. By having a really high quality piece of content, you lead yourself to getting social media shares. As Nicole mentioned, there are good links. There's no more of this buying links, but if social media people are sharing it or there's industry blogs in your niche, and then people are sharing er excerpts from it. Now they're building links to your website. All these things are giving Google a relation saying, okay, well this person didn't go out and try and game the system. They went out and they promoted something that is very, very of high value. So it's taking that aspect and saying, well, we put a ton of effort into creating it. And I think that a lot of people run into that, is that you create something and it's outstanding, but it doesn't reach anyone. And there's kind of that roadblock, you're like, well, We've tried the content marketing, but it doesn't work for us. You know, we hear that a lot, but it really is this whole cohesive plan of creating, promoting, and continuing. You know, it has to be a nonstop holistic approach. And it really lends itself to combining on and offline marketing efforts. Um, you know, the same thing with that Mac Shop example with reviews. You know, have they taken an offline example and they may start reaching out for more reviews? It really just builds up that credibility. Or if in your business, you know, if you want to add more testimonials, more of that you know, semantic contextual content, using an offline method like email marketing or paper or whatever, like our surveys here, you know, something that you can capture and then can be brought online, it's great. I mean, that's what it's about is get, getting that relation of Google to understand, okay, they're not just trying to tell me they're great, they actually are great for this. As you can see, we actually repurposed Steve's Lunch and Learn into a whole number of uses. We were able to reach out to people on Twitter. We were able to, you know, we had blog posts. It went through our email marketing channels. I'm sure some of you saw it or the recap. If you want to follow our Twitter, again, you know, and then it gets retweets. The Lunch and Learns get shared. Again, it's this natural link building process. <coughs> And I think the same thing holds true to any of your content marketing or SEO type efforts. You know, if it's quality, you can reuse it on multiple platforms. Again, don't 
take that same status and cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste across each of the platforms, make it a little unique. For something like Instagram or Twitter, it may be like that national pen example of a very vivid image. You know, for a blog, it might be longer form content, well broken, well re good readability with subheadings, images. You know, it's really about what is the user looking for? How can you make their experience as good as possible? And really, Google and the world re always rewards value. People that are looking forward to prevent, providing value. So I told you I'd leave you with a new acronym for SEO. Whether you like it or not, I'm not sure. But we're going to look at what should SEO stand for going forward. And my new interpretation is it should stand for synchronize everything online. All your online efforts need to be one cohesive package. And you know, we're fortunate here for putting something like this together in that we have a full package digital team you know, behind us. And that's one of our, you know, our fortunate side of being a digital marketing agency is we have someone specialized in each one. So you know, if you had seen the slides I tried to put together without our creative team, you would have been very been like, oh, this is terrible. But it's having that whole company working together, the whole synchronized. And it's not, it is, I used online because it fit the acronym, but it's really <laughs> synchronizing the online, offline uh, methods. I mean, we have our video team here. There are people downstairs greeting. You know, it's that whole thing like your business. You know, there's people, everyone's working together. And it's just getting that information to Google, to the users. And I think it really, you know, I think it's a benefit. As I mentioned in my uh, prior life as a business owner, I was definitely one of the people that Google was trying to look out for because I was fully intent on gaming the system. And unfortunately, every time I looked at gaming the system, it came back to bite me because down the line they would make a change. And then you know, you're like, oh, that didn't work because of this. But had I just stuck with that quality, I had built one website that was you know, all about when someone is looking for a vacation home, what is it every possible instance they could look for? That website's still doing good because it provides value. Those questions don't, haven't changed. You know? The effort put into that hasn't changed because people still want to know how does insurance relate on a beach house with flood or something of that nature. And again, in your industry, the people, the questions might nuance a little, but the general you know, pain points don't change. So I think we could really look for how do you set yourself up going forward. And I think there is an easy takeaway that you can look for to really setting yourself apart. First, take inventory. Where everybody's company is at a different point of the content marketing and SEO process. Well, where are you at right now? You know, audit, as a content audit, what channels are you using? If you're not using a particular channel, would it make sense? Who is your audience? Then you need to establish those goals. You know, where do you want to go in the time frame? Is it a year? Is it three years? Is it five years? How are you going to get there? What's the process? Do you, you know, are there certain things you can handle in-house? Are there certain things that it would make more sense to look have someone like us help with? Or you know, is it better for uh, us to do a holistic campaign? You know, there's lots of options. We're really here to help you guide your process going forward. Repurposing, again, if you're going to take anything away, create something that's just so much better than anyone else in your industry and reuse it. I, really, it's going to give you the largest reach just the consistency has to be there, though. You can't think this is a one-off and done. You can't say, well, month of March, we're going to do one great piece of content, and then we're going to put one out in August. Really, it's that, you know, if it's a once a month thing, for some businesses, it might be once a week. But if it's once a month, it's extremely high quality. You're repurposing it across all those channels. You might have a month's worth of stuff to put out. It may have had a significant cost. But again, you're moving forward. You have this plan. And that's about all I have. I, Hope everybody found some value from Nicole and I today. If you have any questions, you can feel free to uh, send us an email or give us a call. Thank you.